Here are tonight's top stories brought to you by Four Seasons, heating, air conditioning, plumbing, and electric. Aaron Judge is staying in the Bronx. The AL MVP agreed to a massive nine-year, $360 million deal with the Yankees early this morning. Meantime, his teammate, Jamison Tyone, is coming to Chicago. Tyone, 14-5 last year with a 3.91 ERA. He has signed with the Cubs. And our friend Wilson Contreras officially has a new home. The beloved catcher replaces future Hall of Famer Yadier Molina. He is now a Cardinal. Let's go on the beat to San Diego with our guy, Cubs insider, Gordon Wittenmeyer, my friend. A few years ago, most of us thought Cody Bellinger might be getting Aaron Judge-type money. Then he hurts a shoulder, he has some poor performance, and the next thing you know, the Cubs are getting him on a one-year deal. Do you like that signing? I, I do like that signing, mostly because uh, there's a truism in the industry, right, that there's no such thing as a bad one-year deal. It's seventeen and a half million, but they've got so much payroll flexibility, it really doesn't. It really doesn't matter. They'll either get the value of that on a bounce-back season and the upside that he presents as a former MVP. He's got that kind of talent, former 47 home run guy, and by the way, a former gold glove outfielder. So if he's healthy and motivated and change of scenery does anything, I, I like that contract. It does uh, so many things for you. And he's a left-handed bat. Uh, they haven't had one of those as a, as a potential monster in the middle of their lineup, um, at least since uh, Anthony Rizzo left. All right, let's talk about the other signing that they made late last night. Jamison Tyone leaves the Yankees. He was 14-5 and five with an ERA in the high threes, and he gets four years at $68 million. Your thoughts on that signing? Yeah, it's one of those things. That they've had their eye on him for a while. It's not the top of the market. It's the next tier, um, but it's a, it's a, it's a solid four-year deal. This guy, has, this, this guy is one of those pitchers. He's had some adversity, some health adversity and, and some uh, cir circumstances in his career that have, you could make the case have presented, uh, prevented him from being one of the guys who would have been a top-tier pitcher in this market. Um, and so – you could you could be looking at a, a very uh, value added type guy for the type of contract that he's getting four years, 68 million. Um, he's also pitching in big market, performed. Uh, he slots right into the, the at least the middle of that rotation. And um, and and look at this too, right? So Carlos Rodon, uh, a strikeout guy. Uh, Kode Senga coming from over over in Japan. He's a he's a strikeout type pitcher. Has that kind of stuff. They're not in the market for those guys. Look at their rotation. It's already a contact rotation. Ty owns another contact guy. Um, and they added who? A guy that's got a gold glove in the outfield to an outfield that already had a player grow into a gold glove outfielder and left. And what are they in the market for? They're in the market for gold glove shortstops. And in a case like that, your guy who did a nice job for you at short moves over to second where he was a gold glove finalist. What does this tell you? It tells you that they're building a landscape that's got maybe a foundation for some run prevention that starts with defense. And what do we know about defense in baseball? It doesn't slump. And so you can, if you can build a team that year after year is a, is a defensive-minded team, then you can plug all kinds of pitching into that, that, that if it's healthy and they do their thing, whatever style of pitcher they are, you're preventing runs. It's a great place to start for for what, what they used to call a foundation for sustained success, look no no farther than, than down Highway 55 in St. Louis for the impact of team defense. Gordon, let's talk about what they have yet to accomplish. That is land one of those big shortstops. Are they in place still on Correa? Are they in place still on Dansby Swanson? And is Xander Bogart probably headed back to Boston? It looks like Bogarts is headed back to Boston. The Cubs did talk to him at one point, uh, but they didn't get as serious about him in the later stages as they did about the other two guys. They're still in play for the other two guys. Um, what has happened overnight is, as we all know by now, anybody that's paid attention to baseball, Aaron Judge is going back to the Yankees on a $40 million a year deal for nine years. The biggest ripple effect 
on that begins with the San Francisco Giants, who have a wad of cash to spend and haven't really been able to do it yet. They were focused on him and some pitching. With Judge off the table, last night a lot of people in baseball thought that Judge was going to wind up in San Francisco. That could have accelerated the Correa market. With Judge back in pinstripes, the, the Giants are turning attention to Correa and maybe some others, but definitely Correa. And the Padres, who were in on the fringes of, of the judge uh, talks, also could be in that market. So what appears to be happening as a lot of executives leave the meetings now because they, they, they moved it up a day, uh, it's ending a day earlier than normal, as the lobby sort of begins to empty out, it looks like that market, which was very hot the first couple of days of the week, could cool off a little bit for a while. It could extend a little bit. Those talks will continue to go on and 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 uh, the agents will play out those markets. But with the, the Giants and the Padres potentially in, th there's a lot more to sort out that's probably going to take at least the better part of probably the next week. Do you see the Cubs doing anything else in the next couple of days? Trey Mancini play first. Is there a catcher, Christian Vasquez, a trade perhaps? Do you think they get anything else done before they leave San Diego? Uh, not before they leave San Diego. Uh, that's that's happening in, in later today, early tomorrow. They'll all be out of here. So that's not going to happen. The, as far as trades goes, you're going to be looking at inc incremental things, probably smaller things. Um, but, yeah, if, if they do anything sooner rather than later, and by sooner I mean in the next few days, you're probably looking at maybe they make a move on a catcher if it's not Christian Vasquez, because as we know, Wilson Contreras just signed with the with the Cardinals, a reached agreement, and that means Vasquez is now front and center on that free agent market, and Sean Murphy is still in play as a trade chip from Oakland. So uh, if they if they decide to go somewhere else with the catching, that could happen quickly. And otherwise, some incremental pieces. They'll still be in the pitching market. A reliever could happen sooner rather than later. That's another starting pitcher is going to take a little bit of a, a needle being thread, depending on how that might fit into what now looks like a a fuller rotation. So uh, I keep I don't think it's going to be anything that blows your mind. Um, so just keep watching that shortstop market. That's the place to watch for these guys. All right. I know Dansby Swanson's getting married this weekend to a girl that plays for the Chicago Red Stars. Do you expect him to make a decision before his wedding or I'm going to get married and then I'll figure it out? I, if you would have asked me that question 24 hours ago, I would have said, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. As we sit here today, based on how the markets changed in the shortstop landscape with the judge signing, I know that's that's a lot of moving pieces there. Uh, I, I would say no just because there's still three shortstops out there. Xander Bogarts looks like he's the closest one to possibly be signed, maybe going back to Boston. And, and then you so you've got the two other shortstops to play out, two other shortstops, two different agents. One of them's Correa, who's going to be looking for a ton of years and a ton of money. And the other one's Dansby Swanson. Might not be looking for quite as much, but is definitely, uh, definitely would, would have a lot more leverage by then. All right, I don't see any big fish swimming around behind you, so I will take it that... You have your night free. Good luck, Gordon. I will talk to you later on our podcast. All right, Cap. Take it easy. As Gordon said, Bellinger's glove, that will play. He was responsible for seven outs above average last year, top 10 among major league center fielders. Compare that to the Cubs last year, who were the worst in the bigs in both outs above average and runs prevented. All right, time for a quick break. We're talking a potential number one wideout the Bears could target this offseason with the athletic straight football writer, Robert May. Next.
All right, time to go on the Bears beat. We've got the host of the Athletic Football Show, NFL writer. He's a great follower on social media. He is Robert Mays, a Chicago area guy. Okay, I'm 62. You're, I'm going to guess, mid 30s. Neither That's of right. us I'm have 35. been. There you go. Neither of us have been this excited to watch a Bears quarterback in our lifetime. So give me your take on. The thought, Alex Brown, who I work with on the post game, said Justin should not take another snap this year. Shut him down. Charles wow. Barkley said the same thing today. Shut him down. What do you say? I understand uh, that's probably the prudent way of thinking about it because his health and his long-term outlook is the most important thing. But what kind of message does that send to the rest of the locker room? The fact that he's bigger than everybody else. He doesn't have to play, even though we're still acting like the games matter. I get both sides of it, but I think that's just a hard sell when he's healthy enough to play. If they had made that decision last week after the injury, then I totally understand it. We, we don't have any idea of where he's at. And we, seem t we t see teams do that all the time. Think about what the Rams are doing right now with some of their, their guys. They know it's over and they're acting like it's over. But we've seen him come back and be healthy enough to play and play well. So I think the timing on that is pretty tough. If they had done it a week ago, sign me up. But right now, I think that's hard to pull off. Okay, but I would push back on you for this reason. And I've been the guy saying, if the doctors clear him and say, you're at no greater risk, you can go, then football players play. But in the second half on Sunday, that was not the same guy we saw in the first half. They didn't let him run very much. And he said after the game, yeah, when I had to take on Kenny Clark, I felt it in my shoulder. When I hear that, bye-bye, Justin. Wherever you're at, Cabo, Cancun, Playa del Carmen, stay there. I'll see you in the spring. That's fine with me. I, I That's a good point. And I think that if that's the situation and it is re-injured, if he's in a similar situation that he was before the Jets game and they're worried about it, there's no upside for him continuing to play. You've seen all that you need to see. You've gotten all the information you need to start making decisions in the offseason. You've seen enough progress from him to feel like the live reps have been beneficial instead of detrimental, which early in the season, that wasn't necessarily the case. So if that's the decision that they make, I'm totally fine with it. Let's talk about where this team is because you know, the Jets aren't going to win the Super Bowl, but they are a vastly improved football team. They have 14 first-round picks on their roster, five more second rounds. That's 19. By my count, I'm not talking about Leatherwood or guy uh, Nikhil Harry that they've picked up that were cast-offs. They have one of their own first-round picks <laughs> out of 53-man <laughs> roster. How far away is Chicago in your mind? Very far. I, I multiple years. And, you know, the Jets are a good example on the other side of things where their multi-year rebuild was accelerated last offseason. You know, they're one of the highest teams in the NFL in cash spending. They've been accruing those first round picks for multiple years. And they kind of knew, all right, we have enough cap space and we have enough draft capital over the last two, three seasons where we can make a push and be a potential playoff team. And that's exactly what happened. If you look at the way that they rebuilt the defense, the Bears can't do what the Jets did last spring in a single offseason, even with all that money, because they just don't have enough underlying talent on the roster right now. So that's why I think they should still be in a mode where they're accruing as many picks as they can. You know, don't worry about breaking the bank and resetting the market for free agents at this point. It's probably not worth it. Spend not frugally, but intelligently, wisely in the market and then just accrue and assemble as many picks as you can still the way that they have been this season with Ryan Pulse. From your experience and talking to all the people you do in the NFL, if the Bears lose out, and I believe that they will, they get the Eagles, the Bills, at the Lions, home with the Vikings to close it out. Let's assume they finish 3-14 and 14 and they get the second pick. Are you trading back or, no, I got to get Will uh, Anderson or I got to get Jalen Carter, I got to get some stud at number two that steps right in because I'm trading back if the deal makes sense. I am as well uh, for the exact reason that I, I just said. I think that they're so far away. Uh, there's so many holes on the roster. There's so few building blocks that if you can, I mean, the last two examples I can think of that are similar to that would be what the Dolphins did with the Niners. Think about the hole the Dolphins got from, my, from San Francisco to come up and get Trey Lance. And then the deal that the Colts made 
with the Jets in 2018. So that deal, the Colts only moved back three spots. I think they got three additional second round picks to do it. The Dolphins got multiple additional first round picks, including future first round picks to move from three to 12. You're going to have to have a conversation with your scouting staff about where you feel like the teardrops in the draft are. If you don't want to go all the way out of the top 10, things like that. But I think that you should be listening. And if you're just taking a look at the top 10 and what it currently looks like, you know, Carolina sitting there at six. That's the sort of team. If Carolina is worried about Denver potentially taking the second best quarterback in the draft with whatever that Rams pick ends up being, they want to move up. What can you get from a team like that that is worried about the teams at five, six, seven, eight poaching the quarterback that they eventually want? As you look at this team there, I'm not a huge fan of their offensive line. I will tell you, I think it's played better as the season has gone on. They're also helped out by the fact they got a very mobile uh, quarterback <laughs> who can make plays with his feet. What do you think of their offensive line? I think it needs to be rebuilt. You know, not from the ground up. You know, there are a couple of guys that I think you give opportunities next year in training camp, but I think you bring in competition even for those guys. Braxton Jones has been excellent in the run game. I mean, his play strength and upper body strength is pretty remarkable. And what he's been able to give them in really every aspect of running game, he's still a work in progress in pass protection. He's got a lot of bad habits, and that's not necessarily surprising. The guy's fifth round pick out of Utah State. He came in from a smaller school. It was going to take a while. He was thrust into a starting role. So I think you give him a chance to continue to develop. But And then Tevin Jenkins is the same way. I, th I think that you come into training camp if you think that he's your starting right guard next year, but you want to make sure that you're giving, putting the right guys in place to push him. I think that's a smart idea. But everything else I think should be on the table. You know, Cody Whitehair is pretty expensive. They've needed an upgraded center for multiple years now. The only reason they didn't get one this year is because Lucas Patrick was hurt in training camp. They need a new right tackle. Like, I don't think there's anybody on that team right now that should be preventing you from adding talent at a certain position. So in my mind, everything should be on the table. Yeah, I've thought about, would it be better to move Braxton Jones to right tackle, go get the best available center I can get? I'm not a huge Lucas Patrick guy. Again, he was banged up. We really don't know. But there's a reason Green Bay said, eh, nine million, you can go. I would go get the best center I can, and I'd sign the best available left tackle in free agency, whether that's Orlando Brown or whoever that might be. Now I've got an anchor in the middle, and I potentially have two pretty good tackles. What do you think? I think that's not a bad way to approach it. You know, left tackles and free agency are, are dicey because normally the guys that hit left tackle hit free agency at left tackle aren't left tackles worth paying at the top of the market. Teams hang on to those guys. And Orlando Brown would be one of those players for me. You know, there's a reason that the Chiefs have been hesitant to give him a top of market deal. He's regressed this year. Uh, I think that we've been able to see that. Uh, a pretty fun possible solution though is that a guy we've seen play left tackle at a pretty high level in the NFL is Yash Naiman from Green Bay who's also hitting free agency because they have an all pro left tackle that's been hurt for the last couple of years so I think he's a, a potentially creative solution you know Elton Jenkins is hitting free agency there are a lot of guys up front that you'd be able to piece together a line with I believe Mitch Morse from Buffalo uh, is going to be hitting free agency center is typically a spot that Teams do well to shop in free agency. Uh, just the history of the position on the market has shown us that if you go there to find one, it typically works out. Even in a guy that's into his 30s, like Mitch Morse says, if you just want a stabilizing factor for a couple of years. So there are options there. But if they're picking in the top 10 and or they move back a little bit and there is a left tackle available, finding a building block like that in the first round of the draft has typically been more fruitful than finding one in free agency. All right, before I let you go, in terms of their wide receiver room, I think it's the worst wide receiver room in the National Football League. I don't know what Darnell Mooney coming off ankle surgery is going to be like, and I'm pretty much done with Pringle, Equinemius, St. Brown, uh, and the other guys they've run through here. Is there anybody you could think of that either might demand a trade, like A.J. Brown got traded by Tennessee or Tyreek Hill got traded by the Chiefs to the Dolphins, or a free agent that you go, there's your number one receiver? The free agent class isn't very good. If I'm looking at guys that might get moved, the Bucks are going to have to start saving money eventually. I don't know what their team building plan is going to look like moving forward, but they're paying 
Mike Evans and Chris Godwin a lot of money. And I don't know if they can necessarily afford that if they're going to try to hit a soft reset button next year. So maybe one of those guys, if you want to start sniffing around, Evans is obviously older than Godwin is. I think they'd be more inclined to move him. And then just get creative. You know, the guy that I keep coming back to is what are the Niners going to do with Brandon Ayuk? Okay, they've already paid Debo Samuel. They're paying Christian McCaffrey a lot of money. George Kittle like, makes a lot of money. They have defensive players. They're going to be up for extensions like Nick Bosa. I don't know if they'll be able to keep all those guys. Ayuk has two years left on his deal. Again, I don't know if they're going to be super excited and motivated to move on from somebody like that. But those are the types of options I'd be exploring because the free agent class is not good. Hey, man, I appreciate all the knowledge. Have a great rest of your week. And thanks again. Happy to do it. Thanks. The Bulls are back in action against the Wizards tonight. The United Center right here on NBC Sports Chicago. Their first home game in over two weeks. Both teams looking to snap three game losing streaks. DeMar DeRozan, part of our same game parlay we're playing for tonight's Tim of the Cap. Brought to you by Points Bet. All right, take a look at this. We're going Corey Kispert over. He always shoots the ball well against the Bulls. Over one and a half threes. He's had four each of the last two games. DeRozan over 25 and a half. Jordan Goodwin, a rookie from St. Louis U. Under Booch to get 15 and get a double-double. Hit that booster, plus 16.92 on your money. All right, time for our stat of the day, brought to you by our friends with Ankin Law, 3126 million for the great power day. It's time, my ball. Aaron Judge's rejection of the Yankees' preseason offer, seven years, $213 million, made him nearly $150 million. Bucks. New contract, largest free agent deal ever in terms of total dollars. As for the White Sox, well, let's go back out to San Diego with Chuck Garpai. Thanks, Cap. Well, the Yankees got Aaron Judge. The Phillies got Trey Turner. The White Sox got a whole lot of criticism for not making any moves here in San Diego at the winter meetings. Uh, Rick Hahn, uh, speaking with the media on Wednesday, said there were productive talks with other teams about trades, productive talks with agents about certain free agents, but no deals made here at the winter meetings. They also added that Better to make a good deal on January 7th than a bad one here on December 7th. Uh, I will say that I did see a certain former MVP candidate roaming the halls here at the winter meetings, and he said to me he would love to play for the White Sox. I will have that for you on the White Sox Talk podcast that will drop later this evening. That's all I got here.
from San Diego. Back to you. I hope that former MVP is less than 50. Time to cap it off. Presented by Chevy Drive Chicago.com. Somebody let the White Sox know that the meetings actually are about to end, not just begin. White Sox, your window to win is open. You have said that for the last 24 months. In fact, you guys have said your own words. We don't want to just win one World Series. We want multiple. Right now, your fan base, and rightly so, is livid. They saw last year go by the boards because of a poor managerial hire, and they're seeing this winter, everybody else, Cubs included, making moves. Nothing on the White Sox front. Not even good rumors. You're better than that. You want people to jam in your ballpark, and they should. It's a fun experience. Start making some deals. Get the checkbook out. Take that. 